Bungo Stray Dogs has a lot of content and it can get super confusing at times, but it's like my favourite story probably ever. Hi, I'm Moon and I'm not gonna lie, after I hit publish on that first video, I kinda panicked because I had absolutely no idea where to go next. When I stopped panicking and thought about it though, I realised that there's only one place that really makes sense to start in, and that's the same place I started when I posted this video. One of my favourite things about Bungo Stray Dogs that I don't see a lot of people talking about is the costume design and how intentional it is. That video is about 6 months old, sitting at 48,000 views, and it kickstarted the series that you guys love so much. But I've had enough of 3 minute videos, so it's time to take a deep dive. In a perfectly safe contraption, of course. I'd never dream of sending you lot anywhere in an unstable vehicle. But before we really get started, I just want to thank you for watching. If you like my content and want to support me, then you can like this video and subscribe to my channel, or follow me on any of the socials listed below. If you really want to show your support, then the first link in the description will take you to my Ko-fi. There you can make a one-off donation, become a monthly member, or buy something from my digital shop. Member benefits include exclusive content, early access to YouTube videos, and prioritised requests for TikToks, all for as little as two Australian dollars per month. If you already support me, thank you so much, I can't begin to describe how much it means to me. I also quickly want to give you guys a content warning before you watch this. I'm going to be discussing themes of abuse, particularly child abuse, and also suicide. I'll also be spoiling Kyoka and Yosuno's backstory, and basically the entirety of the Dark Era. You will get plenty of warning before any character is discussed and there are also timestamps in the description so you can skip to whichever one you like. So now, let's get into it. Asagiri and Harukawa have made a point to mention multiple times in interviews that they take a lot of care with their character designs. For example, Harukawa once revealed that each organisation, of which there are quite a lot, has its own colour scheme. And I just want you to keep this in mind as we delve into this analysis. Everything is there on purpose. And something that I noticed as I was researching these characters is that their clothing doesn't just represent how others view them, but also how they view themselves. If you're as into this sort of thing as I am, then seeing these interviews was super cool because all of these nitpicky little details were put there on purpose and the creators wanted us to find them. It seems fitting to begin by talking about Atsushi because he is our lead protagonist. Atsushi is 18 years old, a member of the armed detective agency, and an ability user who can transform into a white tiger at will. And what I really love about Atsushi's character design is that he began in grey rags. His costume was relatively featureless and it represented the way that he viewed himself as a nobody who had no hope of surviving in the world. It also represents the idea that he could be moulded into pretty much anything. And when he joined the armed detective agency, that's exactly what happened. He was gifted a set of new clothes with one item being gifted from each existing member. His button-up shirt was from Konikita and pants from Fukuzawa, his tie from Yosuno, the fingerless gloves from Rampo, suspenders from Kenji, the boots from the Tanazakis, and his long black belt was from Dazai. Atsushi's life was suddenly filled with purpose and meaning when he met the armed detective agency. And here we watch him slowly begin to build confidence and start to solve cases on his own. He went from a lonely nobody to someone who has the friendship and support of an entire family of people. He became someone because they believed in him. His outfit is also so fitting for a transformative ability and I love how his belt looks like a tail when he's in human form. Now, it would be stupid to talk about Atsushi without mentioning Akutagawa because these two were designed to be opposites. <音声><音声><音声><音声><音声> Asagiri said that when he was brainstorming characters, he had this vision of a white Atsushi versus a black Akutagawa. And this is a super fascinating theme that he likes to play around with, the harmony of two opposing forces balancing each other out. And don't get me wrong, characters dressed in black who battle against characters dressed in white 
is a trope that's super easy to find in pretty much any media, and the clothing usually represents good and evil or life and death. But in Bunko Stray Dogs, black and white represent dark and light, with the Port Mafia ruling over the darkness and the armed detective agency balancing them out by ruling the realm of light. Technically, the agency rule the dawn and dusk or the twilight of the city, which is why their colour scheme is more beige and brown than pure white, but my point still stands. The thing is, Asagiri makes a point that none of these characters are strictly light or dark, they're all various shades of grey. And they're all ruled by the ideals that a truly light or dark person might follow. When we first meet Akutagawa, who is a notorious Port Mafia killer with a deadly ability, our focus is drawn immediately to his huge black overcoat. And it is incredibly important to him, of course, because it helps him to activate his ability, Rashomon, which is a monster that can destroy anything in its path, including space itself. But I want you to pay attention to how his shirt is white. If you've come from TikTok, you've probably heard my coat theory already, but allow me to just restate it for you. When a character wears a coat or other form of outerwear that serves to hide the rest of their outfit, especially if that coat is a different colour, it usually means that they're putting on a facade or they're just trying to hide something. Now, Akutagawa does a lot of terrible things and he thinks of himself as a truly terrible person. But the more we learn about him, the more we realise that he's actually very good, if a little misled. And he is a perfect example of the coat theory because he too was once in grey rags before he was brought into the Port Mafia. There he forced himself to carry the burden of a high-ranking member, putting on this mafioso persona the same way that someone would put on a heavy coat. His outfit also gives us an insight into his view of the world, which is a very black and white survival of the fittest outlook. And it's representative of his honesty, which often errs on the side of cruelty, but sometimes it can be really kind. Another character who is designed to look good standing next to Atsushi is Kyoka. <laughs> Harakawa has mentioned that Kyoka looks like she was always meant to be a heroine who stands with the agency, so why did she start in the Port Mafia? While at the ripe old age of 14, Kyoka is one of the Port Mafia's deadliest assassins, and she introduces herself to us as such. This is difficult to conceptualise because she looks and acts like any other young girl. She likes tofu and rabbits, her hair is tied in pigtails, she can break the resolve of anybody with a single holy shit, what is that? Yeah. So there's the slight issue of her ability, which is a spectral katana-wielding bodyguard named Demon Snow. And it was technically this ability that caused her parents to pass away, which is a trauma that Kyoka will carry with her for the rest of her life. Her phone is at first the only thing that allows her to control Demon Snow, but even once she learns to do so without it, she keeps it with her. It becomes a symbol of her trauma and guilt, but also of remembrance for her family. And I want to quickly point out that even without Demon Snow, Kyoka is a force to be reckoned with. I personally would never cross her because I wouldn't even know that she's after me until it was already too late. And a super interesting thing about Kyoka is that when she moved from the Port Mafia to the Armed Detective Agency, her costume remained the same. Every other time we've witnessed a character crossing from one organisation to another, one of the first things that changes is their outfit. Atsushi, Akutagawa, Dazai, Chuya, Yosuna, we've seen this a hundred times before. And what's more, Kyoka's costume was never really fitting for the Port Mafia. To explain this further, I'll first need to talk about Koyo. She is a character that I can't think or talk about without experiencing some really big, overwhelming emotions, because all she ever wanted was to escape the darkness and live in the light. But that life was ripped away from her at the very last second, not only crushing her hope, but also killing her partner. This moment destroyed Koyo's resolve and convinced her that those who are born in the darkness must stay in the darkness because the world of light will destroy them. This is a teaching that she passes on to Kyoka and it's a perfect example of the cycle of abuse and how it works. Lots of people get confused when we call it a cycle because it looks more like a chain when you consider that someone abused Koyo who then abused Kyoka blah 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 
but we're talking less about who was affected and more about how they were affected. So Koyo had her hope ripped away from her in a moment that was meant to be cruel. She then goes on to teach Kyoka that the world is a dark and horrific place. And she doesn't do this out of cruelty, she does it because she wants to protect her, but it ends up hurting Kyoka anyway. It totally changes her outlook on the world, and we see this with how she interacts with the armed detective agency when she first goes there. Despite their shared cynicism though, both Koyo and Kyoka tend to wear bright colours and flowers. Though neither of them believe that they'll ever live in the world of the light, they can't help but dream about it, and this is reflected in their outfits. I'd also like to take a second to point out that Kyoka's traditional outfit serves to make her look cuter, which really works in her favour because nobody is going to look at a little girl in a kimono and say, oh my god, the assassin's coming to kill me. But also, she has heaps of pockets and hidey holes to keep things in. I can't discuss the topic of defecting from dark to light without talking about Dazai, and I can't talk about Dazai until I tell you a little bit about Oda. <laughs> interesting thing about Odasaku is that Asagiri himself has said that he relates a lot to him. So we get a fascinating look into Asagiri's thought process anytime Odasaku is present in the story. And he doesn't appear to have anything special going on about his outfit until you realise that he'd look a lot less out of place if he worked in the armed detective agency instead of the Port Mafia. Oda is a mafioso, but only because he gave up his role as one of the Port Mafia's best assassins. He did this because he wants to create worlds and life as he writes a book, and he doesn't think that he can do that while also killing people. This attitude carries him no favours with the executives, but he really doesn't mind because he's quite happy with this arrangement. Especially since it gives him time to visit the orphan kids that he's taken in, these are kids who had their families destroyed by the Port Mafia. I won't go too much further into Oda's backstory or this video is going to be way too long, but now that we've had a discussion about him, let's move on to Dazai. <laughs> <laughs> When Dazai joined the Port Mafia, he was wearing a black suit, tie and coat, along with a white collared shirt and bandages covering his forearms and his right eye. His coat should look familiar to you because this is the exact same one that Akutagawa wears in the present. But you'll notice that here, Dazai wears it off the shoulder. And while this could be chalked up to the questionable fashion choices of teenage boys, it has more to do with the fact that this coat represents the ideals of the Port Mafia. Dazai was taken in by Morty Ogai, who is now the boss of the Port Mafia, when he was 14 years old and just after he had first attempted suicide. He agreed to work with Morty in exchange for a quick and painless death, because remember, Dazai likes suicide, but he doesn't like pain and suffering. I see. So this is a way to commit suicide. You chose to do it and you think that it's working. I don't see what the problem is. I like the idea of suicide, but I'm not at all interested in pain and suffering. <laughs> Who wants that? Also, I only want right. after the fact this isn't actually a form of suicide, it's more a form of war. There! And Morty is a doctor, so he could really easily get his hands on a lethal injection if Dazai just behaves himself. But everything goes downhill when Dazai witnesses Morty murdering the old Port Mafia boss. With this, he is now trapped in the Port Mafia with this hefty secret that he has to keep. That doesn't mean that he has to fully commit to the role though, and while Dazai does do everything that Morty asks him to with relatively little complaint, we can see how ready he is to drop this persona. When he hands his coat to Akutagawa, he is passing down the burden of a Port Mafia executive, and Akutagawa, not knowing any better, just shoulders it immediately. And would you look at that, the cycle of abuse is back, I wonder how Akutagawa deals with it. I'm kinda sorry I asked. Dazai graduates to a new coat, one that resembles Morty's, and continues his role in the Port Mafia until that fateful night where Odasaku passes away. And here we get the quote that sums up at least two of the largest overarching themes of Bungo Stray Dogs. Odasaku. 
私はどうすればいい人を救う側になれどちらも同じならいい人間になれ So with this, Dazai leaves the Port Mafia and upon joining the armed detective agency gets a new outfit that looks like this. The new colours perfectly complement his new organisation and the coat looks very much like Oda's. It represents Odasaku's ideals and unlike his Port Mafia coat, Dazai fully commits to wearing this one and he's rarely seen without it. <laughs> I'm not crying. I swear, I'm actually not crying, I promise. Thousands of tears later. Just like how Kyoko was designed to look good standing next to Atsushi, Kunikira was designed to compliment Dazai. <laughs> Ironically, though they're in the same organization and their outfits look very similar, these two are as different as day and night. While Dazai is nonchalant and often described as lazy by others, Kunikita is professional, diligent, and practical to a fault. This results in the two almost constantly bickering, and Kunikita often punishes Dazai for his insolence. <laughs> <laughs> Kunikita is, after all, the future of the agency, and Dazai knows this, which is why he's constantly pushing his buttons. Dazai is determined to push Kunikita to his limit to try and see where and when he breaks. Though really, he is desperately hoping that he won't break because he cares very deeply for Kunikita and for the rest of the agency. Despite their bickering and their differences, these two are actually fantastic partners. And Kunikita even goes so far as to tell Dazai that he couldn't ask for a better partner. You'll notice that though Kunikita's outfit is made up of cool toned pieces, he wears a red ribbon around his neck. This is because of the guilt and trauma that follows Kunikita after the Azure Messenger incident, and in the Beast universe, which I am not getting into right now, but you can expect a massive video on that later, Kunikita wears blue. It matches him quite well, it matches his personality and his outfit a lot better than red, but in Beast, he never had to deal with the Azure Messenger. It, it hurts a little bit. His ability is also really cool, it allows him to create anything by writing it in his notebook and tearing out a page. The issue is that he has two very specific constraints on this ability. The first is that he has to have seen the object before he can draw it to life, and the second is that it has to fit within the size of his notebook. Though all the abilities in this story have constraints, not all of them are as specific as this. Another great example would be Yosuno's ability, Thou Shalt Not Die. Yosuno is the detective agency's physician. She wears a white collared shirt tucked into a black skirt and tights with heels, a black tie, gloves, and a gold butterfly clip. Butterflies are one of my favourite thematic symbols ever because they can represent so many different things. A common one is reincarnation and new life, and Yosuno herself has been reincarnated a couple of times within the story. Metaphorically reincarnated. She has brought herself back to life with her ability a couple of times, but I wouldn't really count that as reincarnation, it's more like resuscitation. Before she was with the armed detective agency, Yosuno worked under the control of Morty. Like the Port Mafia Morty, not when he was in the Port Mafia, but I'll get into him a bit more later. These two were surgeons on the front lines of the Great War, and Yosuno's job was to use her ability in order to restore them to full health. 
With her, there was zero recovery time, so these guys could just get straight back up and out to fighting immediately. And Yosuno was hailed as an angel. She quickly became friends with all of the soldiers. One in particular used his metal manipulation ability to create the butterfly clip that she wears today. He told her that she was very just in her actions. The butterfly clip was a symbol of new life, and this was her first reincarnation. However, as the war continued with no end in sight, the soldiers began to resent Yosuno because they were going through the trauma of dying hundreds of times, but they had to keep on living and going out to fight. Yosuno went from being an angel to an angel of death, and the man who gifted her the butterfly clip hung himself in the barracks. He left her a dog tag which had a tally line scratched in every time she had saved his life, and a note that read, you are too just. In this moment, the butterfly clip became a symbol of death and Yosuno was reincarnated again. The loss of her closest friend broke her and she could no longer work, she was sent to a mental facility and she stayed there for two years before Fukuzawa and Rampo found her. Rampo offered for her to come to their newly formed armed detective agency and she wanted to decline but then he showed her her butterfly clip and gently reminded her that her ability is one of good. The butterfly, once again, represented new life, and Yosuno was reincarnated for the third and so far final time. Now the thing I didn't mention earlier is exactly what the constraint is on her ability. Because Yosuno can heal any injury, it's true, but the issue is the person that she's healing must be dying in order for her ability to work. So often she has to inflict more pain on them, drag them closer to death, and then she's able to heal them. I've always thought this was a really interesting constraint to have on a healing ability, and again it brings her closer to representing death than to representing life. And it feeds further into the idea that nobody is black or white, they're all shades of grey. <laughs> From the few mentions of Morty so far, you probably think that he's a terrible person, and you would be absolutely right. He is truly one of the most awful and polarizing characters in Bongo Stray Dogs. Morty wears a black three-piece suit, a white button-up shirt, and a pinstripe tie underneath a big black coat and a long red scarf. When he's in public and trying to avoid being recognized as the Port Mafia's boss, he wears a more generic, I'm a doctor outfit. And the reason that he is so despised by Bungo Stray Dogs fans is because he is a master manipulator, and he often uses his skills and tactics in order to abuse the people who trust him. The most obvious examples of this would be his treatment of Yosuno during the Great War, and also Dazai when he was younger. I talked before about how Dazai left the Port Mafia because Odosaku died, but I forgot to mention that he died because Morty killed him and he did it knowing that it would break Dazai. In terms of his outfit, I don't have much to share with you. Obviously, he wears his coat properly because he is upholding the Port Mafia's ideals. And his scarf, I think, represents control, which is a major part of his personality and his ability. This is his ability, by the way. It's called Vitus Sexualis. And yes, this young girl is not actually a girl. She is his ability. Her name is Elise, and Morty controls literally everything about her. Her appearance, her personality. Personality. A really interesting thing to note is that she didn't always used to be as snarky as she is now. She became like that after he met Yosuno and he decided that he liked it. Are you starting to see why we hate this guy? And the reason that I say the scarf in particular represents control is because in Beast, Dazai wears a scarf and he is the head of the Port Mafia and he is a controlling, manipulative piece of sh So there's a theme there. Do you get what I'm saying? While we're sort of half back on the topic of coats, I want to talk about the hunting dogs. <laughs> This organization is made up of five members with incredibly strong abilities and they're sometimes called the Mad Dogs. These people regularly undergo maintenance surgeries so that the pressure they're putting on their bodies won't kill them. 
and they work closely with governments around the world to hunt down and capture rogue ability users. The five members are Oichi Fukuchi, Teruko Okura, Sakiko Juno, Techo Suehiro, and one hidden member who I will not reveal to you because I've given you too many spoilers today. Their outfit is a standard military uniform paired with a cape, a cap, and a sword. And in the original drawings, it was meant to be olive green, but in the anime, they changed it to red. That's because the old colour made them look too similar to the military uniforms of the Japanese Imperialist Army and Nazis. So I'm very glad that they changed that. But with this in mind, you have to know that we get some very good hints at who the fifth member was. You just need to be looking for someone in an olive green outfit rather than a red outfit. I'm sure that if you keep your eyes peeled, you will very easily be able to figure it out. There is an awesome theory by Miam on Tumblr that I've linked in the description if you want to go read in full. But basically it states that the hunting dog's capes represent their loyalty to the group. Loyalty and justice are mega important for these guys, but the issue is if you asked people to define these things, it means something different to everyone. And though the promotional art will show all five members of the hunting dogs wearing their full uniform, Teruko never wears her cape in the manga, ever. This is despite being a vice captain and despite being exceptionally loyal to the group and to the captain, Fukuchi in particular. I have a theory that her ideas of justice at first aligned with the hunting dogs, but eventually started to diverge. Similarly to what happened with Eren and the Survey Corps in Attack on Titan. I won't go too much further because again, spoilers, but do keep an eye out for their capes and how they're worn and treated throughout the story. One of the hunting dogs is actually a member of the Decay of the Angel. I'm not going to spoil who it is, but I desperately needed a segue between these segments and couldn't figure out what else to say. So, the Decay of the Angel, who are they? What do they do? What is their goal? Those are some fantastic questions and I wish that I could answer them all confidently, but unfortunately, we really don't know much about these guys. At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that Harakawa has said that specific organizations have colors associated with them. In that same interview, they talked specifically about the decay of the angel and how their color palette is white and purple, which is an interesting choice because I want you to picture what those colors mean to you for a second. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The decay of the angel is a terrorist organization. <laughs> So it's a, it's an interesting choice, to say the least. And on the topic of the Decay of the Angel, one of the most commonly requested characters that I get asked to analyze on TikTok is Fyodor. But I don't know shit about this guy. Fyodor is potentially the most mysterious character in Bungo Stray Dogs, which makes him an absolutely terrifying enemy. Even his ability, crime and punishment, is yet to be explained. We've seen him use it to kill someone who touches him, we've seen him use it to kill someone standing on the other side of the room. Even Dazai, who is arguably one of the smartest characters in the story, has no idea how Fyodor's ability works. And during Dead Apple, when everyone got separated from their ability and had to fight them in order to get it back, Fyodor and his ability were just sitting there like best buddies. They, they were very happy to just spend time with one another. His wiki page is basically empty. This is how little we know about him. I can kind of speak on two things and they're both to do with his costume. The first is the fact that he wears a black cloak over white clothing. This could represent the fact that his ideals are very Puritan, he does view the world in a very black and white way, and he will do whatever it takes to create a perfect world, which is good in his eyes, but he goes through horrific things to do that. The second is that his clothing includes a lot of religious imagery, and this is a theme that we see repeated throughout the real Dostoevsky's books. And that's literally it. The only other fun Fyodor fact I have off the top of my head is that he's really bad at Japanese, which is pretty funny actually. Meanwhile, the overarching storyline of Bungo Stray Dogs describes how these organizations from all across the world are scrambling to get their hands on a book. Not just, not just a book, the book. And the reason is because the book is a reality altering device that can change the universe if you write in it. 
There are constraints to this, of course. You can't just write like a list. You have to write it in a narrative format. So it has to flow and it has to make sense considering everything that's happened so far. Fyodor managed to get his hands on a page from the book and he used it to create a man. This man is Sigma, and yes, he has my absolute favorite character design out of everyone in this story. What else can you expect from me when he has split dyed purple hair and a sparkly coat? It's I can't help it, he's perfect. Sigma, having randomly appeared in the middle of nowhere one day, wandered the earth for a little bit until Fyodor picked him up and put him in charge of the Sky Casino. And Sigma's ability, information exchange, allows him to, wait for it, exchange information with the person that he's touched. There is a catch, of course, because this is an information exchange, he gets something from them, but they also get something from him. His costume was also designed to match Fyodor's, which I think is a fantastic choice because Fyodor literally brought the guy to life. And I love his coat so much, not just because it's pretty, but also because I think it's really fitting for someone who can carry around all that crazy information in his head. I, he's so perfect. As much as I love Sigma, that's all I've got in terms of character design. In fact, the only Decay of the Angel member that I can talk about at length is Nikolai. <laughs> Nikolai's design is striking in its resemblance to a clown and that's really who he is. He is a performer. And the thing with him is that we've never seen his true personality and I don't know if we ever will. From what we've seen though, he is sadistic and theatrical and he takes great pleasure from tricking and hurting other people. He has a very interesting dynamic with Atsushi in particular, especially if you look at them with the idea of the ringmaster and the tiger in mind. Because tigers obviously are super dangerous and they could tear you limb from limb, but they are notoriously abused by circus staff. Often they die in the circus because of how terribly they're mistreated. And when Atsushi met Nikolai, this dynamic came to life and it was really difficult for me to read. It was even harder to watch when it was animated. The other thing that makes me think that we've never seen Nikolai's true personality is the fact that he's so forgiving towards Fyodor. This twisted sadistic man forgives the guy who tries to kill him. It doesn't make sense. He also claims to not feel any remorse or guilt for the things that he does, but he is fully aware of how terrible they are. Again, just not adding up. If we ever do see his true personality, and that is a huge if, I don't think it's going to be anything like what we expect. And speaking of expecting things, I'm sure that you're wondering why it's taken me so long to bring up Chuya in this conversation. And I'm truly sorry for leaving him to last. He's my favorite character too. This was genuinely difficult for me to do. But his analysis is going to be riddled with spoilers for the Stormbringer novel. So if you don't want to see that, then you should skip to this timestamp. Let's get into it. So now it's just everyone who's read Stormbringer. How's the depression treating you guys? Mm. Yeah, me too. I'm doing really great, actually. So I know I asked you to think about your problems just then, but let's ignore them for now because we're going to talk about the one thing that you really clicked on this video for. <laughs> To you, my beloved, you have some very interesting fashion choices. But look, it's pretty tame compared to the literal clown that I just showed you, so we're going to get into why it's important that he looks like this. Before he joined the Port Mafia, Chuya was a member and leader of the Sheep, but 
There was no real dress code in this organisation. I don't think that his outfit is meant to be representative of really anything, it's just supposed to be a stark difference between before and after he joined the Port Mafia. So in that sense, it kind of represents his youth and naivety. His new outfit is very sharp, it's a three-piece suit, heel boots, gloves, a ribbon bolo tie and a cloak. The only echo of his old self lies in the choker and the red on his vest and the lining of his coat. I always forget he wears his cropped jacket as well, part of my brain just sees it and assumes it's part of his vest, somehow. Now if we think back to what I said earlier about coats in the Port Mafia, Chuya does fit the bill for that. He was initially manipulated into working for the Port Mafia, but eventually he started working there really hard of his own volition. He doesn't do it because he looks up to the ideals of the Port Mafia though, he did it initially to beat Dazai and then again because he found a family there. But his coat also represents another facade that he wears, and this is to do with his attitude towards Dazai. He wants to convince everyone that he hates him, and by that he means that he doesn't trust him, which is totally fair and understandable, but the thing is, it's not true. Chuya can actually activate his ability, which is gravity manipulation, in different stages. And if he activates corruption, it will channel away all of his energy without him being able to slow down or stop until he dies. So naturally, it's not something he wants to do very often, but it's something that he can do if he has Dazai by his side. Because Dazai's nullification ability can bring Chuya back to his old self. And in some cases, such as the end of Stormbringer, Chuya being able to activate this aspect of his ability saves the entire world. If you look out for it, you'll notice that Chuya never wears his coat when he activates corruption, and that even in times where he rationally thinks that Dazai isn't going to be able to make it in time for him, he trusts him anyway, and he goes with it. Another thing that I've started to notice is that in the Dark Era, Chuya would always stand on Dazai's blind side. So not only does he trust him with his life, no less, but he subconsciously wants to protect him as well. The final aspect of his costume is, of course, his iconic hat. This was a hand-me-down from Velaine, who was essentially his older brother. And I say hand-me-down from Velaine very loosely because it was gifted to Chuya from Morty, who stole it from Velaine, it's a whole thing. Rimbord actually gifted it to Velaine, and there's metal inside of it that allows him to control his ability better. When Chuya and Velaine first met, Velaine was able to create black holes out of nowhere, which is something that Chuya could never dream of. I also want you to think about how Chuya, whenever he fights, he does so with his hands in his pockets. If we take that along with the hat and the fact that he never activates corruption without Dazai, you begin to realise that everything Chuya does, he does in order to control Arahabaki. Maybe it's out of spite, maybe it's to prove that he's human, but he refuses to let this thing get the upper hand on him. Is this where I remind you of this scene from episode one? You made it! Thank you so much for watching this entire thing. I know that there are a lot of really important characters and organizations that I didn't cover today, but never fear because my plan is to eventually cover as many as possible, if not everyone. And I'm also sorry that it took me so long to get this out. I'm still kind of finding my groove and YouTube videos are far more difficult to me than TikTok, so just bear with me. I love hearing your thoughts and ideas, so please leave a comment or two if you would like. My DMs are also open on TikTok and Instagram, and I have a comment feature on my Notion, which by the way is full of handy Bungo Stray Dogs links and I am planning to keep on updating it. So make sure you check it out if you want to learn more. Give this video a like if you want to, that would mean a lot to me. Subscribe if you want to, that would also mean a lot to me. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye!